Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. By now, you should know it's a red hot labor summer and we are in the middle of it. We have joined the Writers Guild, the Screen Actors Guild, UPS, in telling management that we are mad and we are not going to take it anymore. It is time for a contract here for American Airlines flight attendants. By now, all of you should have seen the announcement that we made that we put out that our, your union leadership unanimously, unanimously approved a strike authorization vote for our members. If you haven't seen it, it's out there on Instagram. There has been hotlines. It's all over the news. The White House is calling us to find out what is happening here at American Airlines. What's going on? Why do we not have a contract? We've been on many uh, TV shows, interviews lately. Um, they all want to know what's happening and what's going to happen to their flights that they're going to take this summer and possibly uh, in the holiday season. It's been four and a half years since we have seen a raise here. That is way too long. We have worked through the hardest time in history through the pandemic, and it's time that we see improvements to our compensation and definitely improvements to our work roles. We have new hire flight attendants here at American Airlines making less than $2,300 a month. They have to live in the 10 highest cost of living cities across this country. They cannot live on those wages. That's before the taxes are taken out. That is unacceptable. We have not seen improvements in our work roles since we negotiated this contract, which was a merger contract in 2014. It's well past time. It's time for American to come to the table and to finalize this contract and to realize that we are not here for concessions. We are here for improvements to our work rules and our wages. Today, we are going to go through how you vote for the strike authorization vote. Where, how, why, um, everything. We're gonna walk you through the website and then we're gonna get into negotiations and what's been happening at the table. Um, hopefully you're all uh, on Instagram because we post a lot on Instagram these days. Uh, that's ABFA Unity and hopefully you're all signed up for the emails. Um, we'll get started here and make sure that um, you know how um, to vote and also that there'll be a lot more information coming out to you about this strike authorization vote. Uh, before we get started with that, though, first I'm going to go uh, pass it on to our lead negotiating attorney, Joe Burns, and he's going to talk a little bit about what's happening in negotiations today. Joe? Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're at in the bargaining and a little bit about the sort of the strike uh how that fits into our bargaining strategy and so forth and a little bit on the uh, timeline of the negotiations. Um, so, you know, just to uh, start it off, um, you know, I think where we're at overall is we're, we're situated pretty well in the bargaining. Um, normally when you when you bargain, you have a lot of sections of the agreement that you have to go through and it takes a fair amount of time. Um, you know, the negotiating committee has been able to work through um, most of those sections. So if you think about like, you know, training, deadheading, you know, all of the sections of the agreement that are sort of the non-scheduling and non-economic sections uh, have been worked through. Um, most of them are either T8 or have a couple of issues left. Uh, we've worked through all of scheduling and reserve um, in terms of having multiple, multiple passes uh, on those sections. So it's pretty clear what our positions are and what the positions of the uh, of the company. Um, we put our economic uh, proposal on the table and I'll talk a little bit uh, about that after I go through the, the, the rest of this. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, sort of defining the issues, um, being at a place where we've narrowed the issues down enough so that we can engage in the in a struggle over those issues. I think we're 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 at that point. Um, we filed for federal mediation, as you know, and we've had a couple of sessions with the federal mediators. Um, so so we're at the point where 
it, it's pretty clear to us uh, you know, where, where the company's position is on a lot of matters. And on the scheduling and other items, we know what the fights are going to be, and we'll talk about those in a bit. Um, but, you know, management's going in the opposite direction. They're demanding uh, concessions on some key areas, and we're, hell no, we want improvements. So, so I think we have a classic uh, labor divide there. Um, on the economics, even though we don't have their economic proposal, we have a pretty good idea of how they view the world, and it's fundamentally different than ours. Um, we're going in there demanding, you know, fundamental improvements in economics, and I think they have a vision that has the wages and economic provisions uh, way lower than where we uh, see they need to be. So where does that leave us? Uh, traditionally, uh, when you get to this point in bargaining and you're not able to reach an agreement, uh, the tool that we have uh, as a labor union and as workers in this country uh, is uh, the threat of a strike. Um, so that's why your negotiating committee and board of directors uh, has uh, recommended a strike authorization vote because that's absolutely essential in bargaining. Um, I've been bargaining in the airline industry for 20 years. Oh, and more in other industries. And, uh, you know, strike votes are a routine part of bargaining. It's a it's a necessary part of bargaining. We've done it time and time again, uh, where, you know, at AFA, where I have taken, we have taken strike votes and we have combined it with picketing and we forced management to come to agreements that were far, far different from where they wanted to be. So I think that's sort of the game plan here is uh, to use a strike vote to send your negotiating committee back to the table uh, with uh, the power and the leverage uh, to change the dynamics at the bargaining table and to get the flight attendants uh, all of the improvements uh, that you uh, deserve. So, you know, I think we'll go through a lot of the provisions on when and how to vote and a little bit more on, uh, you know, why it's important. Um, but I want to talk about a little bit about the legal framework for striking and just to, you know, kind of clarify a, a few points. Um, you know, folks will be familiar, and Julie referenced it, that there are, uh, uh, you know, workers around the country are revolting, right? So we have UPS workers, you know, having an August 1st deadline where they're they're saying they have a contractor, they're going out on strike. I see the UAW said that their strike deadline in September is not a suggestion. It's a, it, it's a fact that, that they're either going to have agreements or they're going to be on strike. Um, they're all covered under the National Labor Relations Act, which is a, a different set of laws where at the point of contract expiration, the workers are able to strike. Uh, as you, uh, you know, presumably uh, most of you will be familiar with by now, we're covered by the Railway Labor Act. And just to be clear, under the Railway Labor Act, um, we have the full right to strike. It's just we have a few more hoops that we have to jump through uh, before we can strike. Um, we have to be in mediation, and then we have to be released by the federal mediators. And uh, and uh, and then, then at that point, after a 30-day cooling off period, which I've been through them, they're fairly intense. You try and reach an agreement there. If you can't reach an agreement, then uh, we're able to strike and the company can use whatever tools, uh, economic tools at, at their disposal as well. It's all called self-help. So so anyway, that's that's where we're at. So I just want to dispel a couple um, you know, possible misconceptions that may be out there. On the one hand, you know, I think people need to understand that when we vote to strike, as people, especially folks who haven't been through this, it doesn't mean that we're striking immediately. Uh, there's a very detailed process that we have to go through. We go back to the bargaining table. We see if we can reach an agreement. Then at some point, you know, presumably, you know, this fall or whenever it is, if we're not reaching an agreement with the with the threat of a strike, we ask the mediation board to release us. There's a prolonged, you know, it, they don't just say, oh, we're going to release you right away. They'll get involved. Julie said the White House is, uh, uh, whatever we call it, sniffing around, uh, but they're interested in the in in the negotiations, well, which creates additional leverage for us as well. Um, but uh, but typically, in my experience, that that you know, even when we used to get releases more regularly, that that took a period of time. Um, but on the other hand, I, I think there's an idea out there, and it, it's based on in part on reality uh, that says, "Oh, we can take a strike vote, but we're never going to be able to uh, to strike." And I think we need to be crystal clear here. 
we have an absolute right under the Railway Labor Act to strike. And we will do whatever is in our power with the powers that be in the federal government, whatever we need to do to, uh, to vindicate our rights, right? If that means whatever pressure we have to do. Um, we've had a, you know, I've, I've done a study of kind of what's happened with releases to strike over the last couple of decades. And what's happened is they really, you know, back in the 90s, we regularly were able to get releases to strike. You know, the uh, American flight attendants got released to strike. U.S. Airways, America West, you know, uh, many other carriers were released to strike. That gave us leverage in our contract negotiations to bring them to a conclusion. Over the last couple of decades, they've sort of changed the standards, but we're on to that. And, you know, I think at AFA, and we're going to be working, AFA, APFA, all the unions in the industry are going to be working together to pressure uh, the mediation board and the, and the White House to make sure that the Railway Labor Act is followed, which fully provides for a right to strike if we're unable to reach agreement. So I think we need to be very clear on this, that when we take a strike vote, we've got a process that we have to follow, but we also have the right to strike if necessary. Okay, so hopefully that's uh, uh, clear from that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the, the strike and the importance of a, a high turnout in a strike, uh, uh, you know, high percentage. And that, you know, having done this quite a few times, it's 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 just very essential uh, that flight attendants participate in this process. Uh, typically at carriers, and you might have seen the pilots did it earlier this year, um, the pilots were able to come out and say, what was it, 99% voted and whatever percent voted in favor of a strike. It was a fairly powerful message uh, to the company, not only that the flight, you know, that, that the, the workers are, um, endorsing a strike, but that the flight attendants are unified in sending a message to management that that this is important and that they stand behind their negotiating committee. That's a very, very powerful message. And if you want to get a contract quickly and you want to get the improvements, then not only vote yourself, but encourage your coworkers to get out there and vote. Um, okay, so what we'll do is we'll 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 take that um, strike vote and you know in a in a strong strike vote we'll go back to the bargaining table we're going to have continued picketing and so forth that I assume folks are going to uh, mention later on it's all part of a comprehensive campaign to reach an agreement uh, I, I have a couple more points to uh, cover on this piece and then I'll, I'll I'll be wrapping it up and handing it off uh, I guess I got to talk about economics a bit too. Um, but uh, there's a question about um, the time frame of the negotiations. I, I think I've talked about it a little bit, but you know, I I, I think uh, you know there's a lot of slogans you can use. Is it one day strong, one day longer, one day stronger, as long as it takes. Um, you know, so I think the committee is committed to pushing forward the bargaining. Um, but it's going to end when we get an agreement that's on our terms, and that and that the flight attendants uh want and, and and meets the needs uh how long that will take you know we don't know i think if 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 given where we're at in bargaining if the company came to their senses and agreed to our proposals and we were able to wrap things up that could be a couple months but uh we know that's not the case right it's going to take a, a a fair degree of fighting uh to to get this done um, and, you know, if we have to request a release or anything like that, I've already talked about the timeline and the timeline that takes. So I, I think, uh, you know, we can't uh, get too much in uh, specifics here, um, but based on having done this at quite a few carriers, um, it, it, it's going to take, you know, some sustained picketing and pressure and fighting uh, to get the company to finally realize that they need to be where where they need to be. OK, so uh, I, I think that's all pretty clear. Um, one final question, which is pretty particular, um, was asked to talk a little bit about the risk involved and so forth. And um, the, the right to strike is uh, fully protected under the Railway Labor Act. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a new hire or senior uh, flight attendant. Um, we once we follow the procedures and we're released at the end of the 30 day cooling off period, have the full right to strike. Um, you know, I think we're very, you know, sort of strategic about when and how we strike. 
And as we get closer to that time, we have a lot of tools like intermittent strikes and so forth uh, that we can talk about uh, a bit more. We call it chaos at AFA, but there's uh, various uh, uh, ways that we can, uh, you know, enhance our leverage. But I think that's all for discussions down the road. But just at this point, I, I think folks should, uh, you know, feel confident that we have every legal right to uh, engage at strike activity once we're released. So that was a lot of talking, but I think I'm uh, done with that portion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, I know you got a lot in there. I, I just want to remind everyone, this vote is a strike authorization vote. This is not a vote for a tentative agreement. OK, we are still negotiating. We do not have a tentative agreement for you to vote on yet. But this vote is only for a strike authorization vote. I know we've been getting a lot of questions about that, and we just want to clarify that. Also want to remind everyone that um, this is a fully transparent negotiations. So you can go to APFA.org. And you can see everything that is being negotiated at the table. You can you have every single section on the website. We also have um, we'll be on hotline number 27 coming out very soon uh, to give you the details of our last negotiation session. Um, so we have all the hotlines also on the website for you so you can see the highlights of every session. Just a reminder. All right. Uh, let's move into, we're going to do a walkthrough of how the strike authorization vote will work. And um, I think Josh is going to start off, us off with when do we vote? Right, let me share this slide. All right, so voting opens next Friday, July 28th at 10 a.m. And it will close on Tuesday, August 29th at 11.59 p.m. Uh, so it's just over 30 days of balloting. Uh, and it will take place on the APFA website. In just a few moments, we'll walk through how that's going to work. All right, thanks, Josh. Now we're going to walk through all the resources that we have for our members for the questions that they may have about logging in, about dues, about the strike authorization vote. And Alan, if you want to talk about uh, the phone bank. Okay, we put together a lot of resources uh, for all of our flight attendants here at American Airlines. Um, the first is uh, that we do have a call center. We've got some of our flight attendants that have stepped forward uh, to take your calls and answer any questions you may have uh, related to login issues, dues, uh, payment of dues, and uh, making sure that you are ready to vote in the strike authorization vote. Uh, the call center, uh, the call number is 806. Four, the number four strike that's 806 four strike and it will be open Monday through Friday nine to five central time we will also have some weekend hours on Saturday and Sunday July 29th and 30th and August 26th and 27th again from nine to five and again that number is 806 four strike or 806 four seven eight seven four five three I want to remind everyone too on uh, the call today. This is a recorded session that will be posted on the website afterwards. And please feel free to take screenshots of any of the slides that uh, you find helpful. And and our call center folks right now are just taking inbound calls and answering uh, questions on live chat as well. We'll also be making some outbound calls to members. Um, we will be getting information on those that have not had the chance to call. We do not know how you voted uh, in this process at all, but we just want to make sure that every member is contacted uh, so that they have an opportunity to voice um, uh, to vote in this strike authorization vote. As well, we have another reset source for you. Um, we are uh, have an email for you and it's very simple. It's strike at APFA.org. If you have any questions, uh, we've gotten some questions that Julie and Joe have already answered uh, concerning the strike. So uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Or if you're having any um, login membership questions or anything like that, uh, especially after hours, because we all have some crazy schedules uh, that may not fall in the nine to five uh, kind of realm of the world. So please reach out to us either at the uh, the call number or at strike at APFA.org. And then all of those questions that we get through that email and actually through the call center, we're going to add those to the website. Josh will walk you through that, but those questions will go on to our website under the FAQ page. 
Okay, next up, uh, we're going to talk about the booklet that you will all be receiving in the mail. So in addition to the call center that we have going on, the email that we have, uh, you will be receiving a booklet that looks like this that you also see on screen. It's about the size of our contract, and this includes all the relevant information in terms of what a strike authorization book is, the entire process, and also walks you through a step-by-step -step on how to vote online, which we will also be showing you later in the presentation. Um, if you haven't received it by that week, you can also go online onto the APFA.org slash strike page and view the electronic PDF version. I just want to emphasize it's the same thing that you'll be getting at home. So if you haven't received it, you can go ahead and download it there. Um, everything that you need should be in here, but we've also added the call center, the email, and a couple of the resources that you'll see down the line to address any concerns that may come up after. Okay, so those uh, booklets go out in the mail this week and they should all be receiving them sometime next Thanks week. Yeah. All right, great. All right, let's walk through the website, Josh. All right, let me get my next screen up for you guys. Uh, so voting will take place online at APFA.org. Um, the first thing I'm going to walk through is how to access the strike authorization vote page and how to find more information about the strike authorization vote and what all of this means. Um, so from the home page, we have a button on the home page that says strike authorization vote. You can also click this button or you can visit APFA.org forward slash strike. So I'm going to click on uh, the strike authorization vote button. This will take you to the strike authorization vote page. Uh, we have the phone number and email listed at the top in case you forget it. We also have the call uh, schedule for the call center um, so that you can you know, view that. We have a countdown to when the vote opens. Again, it opens next Friday. Um, two very important things to know is that you must be dues current, and uh, Eric is going to walk through a little bit more later about what that means in order to vote. And you must also be able to log in. Um, We'll walk a little bit through what to do if you have issues logging in and how to get some support. Laura mentioned we have the strike authorization booklet listed on our website. Um, so although you haven't received it yet, you are able to go ahead and start reading that. Uh, that's this button right here. If you click on it, you'll be able to see uh, all of the information that's included in the booklet. Um, and then we also have a series of videos where members of our negotiating committee talk about the strike authorization vote. Kelly walks through what this vote actually is. Uh, Tim talks about how to show your support through wearing your lanyard, your APFA pin, and your bag tag. Eric walks through um, the importance of being dues current in order to vote. And then we, like Julie mentioned, we have a series of FAQs that we are continuing to build off of as we continue to receive questions. Um, so these are all really great resources to find information about this uh, momentous vote. Um, and then lastly, we have negotiation options. Before I show you guys how to get some support with logging in, I do want to mention, uh, Julie mentioned where to find the current status of negotiations. So on the negotiations page, we have a page dedicated to the status of negotiations. If you click on that, um, you can see all of the information, this is transparent, all of the information about where we currently are in negotiations. OK, so I'm going to first show you um, how to log in. So you'll click log in in the upper right hand corner. And uh, you'll input your employee number. And the first profile I'm going to show you is a member uh, that owes a balance. So once you log in in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a balance and you can either click on the balance right here or under your my, my account, you can click pay my dues. And I'm going to click on it so you can see exactly where it takes you. And this will take you to the payment screen. OK. Now, if you're in good standing, it'll show as a, a zero dollar balance. Um, where to find some assistance if you are having trouble logging in. So the first place is if you're on the login screen. Um, the first thing would be is for you to try and reset your password. So you'll hit forgot password and follow uh, that process. 
If you're still having trouble, please click on trouble logging in uh, and visit our support page. On this page, we have a series of videos walking through how to log in. This second one is probably going to be the most helpful for you. It walks through step by step how to reset your password, um, how to uh, walk through that process essentially. So that's a really great video. And then we have other videos on how to pay your dues and how to update your personal information or email address. And as always, if you uh, need some assistance, please call 806 4 strike and they'll be able to offer you some assistance as well. OK, so now I'm going to go through and show you how you will vote when um, voting opens next Friday. So next Friday, um, when you come back to the APFA.org forward slash strike, there will be a button that appears that says log in here to vote. You'll vote on the same exact page that we have all of the information uh, for this strike authorization vote. So you'll click log in here to vote. You log in with your credentials. And then after you log in, uh, you'll see a new button that says click here to vote. So once you click there to vote, if you are a member in bad standing um, at that point, you will receive this error message that will directly direct you to the payment uh, screen. And uh, Eric is going to walk through a little bit more information about that as well. All right, so that is what you will see if you are a member in bad standing. And lastly, I'll show you the full user experience if you are a member in good standing. OK. So you'll log in again. Uh, once you log in, you will see the click here to vote button. You will click on that. It will authenticate you as a member in good standing. Um, at this point, we have a message. This is this will take you to your ballot with Yes Elections, our uh, election vendor. Once you click go to secret ballot. You'll be directed to your ballot. And uh, you'll make your selection. And the next page will be a confirmation screen. Obviously, it's not up and running yet, um, but you'll receive a confirmation screen with your uh, confirming your your ballot selection and then at which point you'll um, submit your ballot. Once you submit your ballot, you will be unable to change your selection and no one, including APFA and the yes elections vendor, no one will know how you voted. We will only know that you voted. Um, just just a reminder that is isn't two steps. So you'll vote and then there'll be another page to, that, confirm. to confirm your vote. That's right. Just want to make sure everybody realizes and it'll be really clear for you on the confirmation page. It will say confirmation in big bold letters at the top. You have not submitted your ballot yet. This is to make sure that you uh, can confirm your selection before you hit submit. Once you submit, you will also receive an email um, email um, notification at the email that you have on file. Uh, with with the fact that you voted and some additional information on how to share that you voted. OK, and while they're in the APFA website, they might just go in and check to make sure that our address um, that we have for our fund attendance is to the correct address. Um, that's really important, especially while we're sending information out to our flight attendants. That's right. And right now is the best time to go ahead and start uh, logging into the website, make, making sure that you can log into the website, making sure that you uh, make any dues arrangements and things like that in advance of next Friday to make sure that you are ready because we are ready. We are ready. All right, Josh, are you? Is it time uh, to move on to Eric or are you one more thing? Make sure. I'm um, sure the support page. Yep, we are going to move on to Eric. All right. Hello everyone, it's Eric Harris here, National Treasurer. I'm going to talk to you today about your membership and how that will affect you when it comes to voting. So there are a couple of key items to remember. The timeline for voting. If you pay your dues, if you are dues arrears or you find out that your dues arrears as you're logging on to this website today um, and you make a payment on the website, there will be three times during the day, which we will update your eligibility. If you make your payment prior to 9 a.m. Central Time, 
then you will be able to vote after 9 a.m. If you make a payment between 9 a.m. and 11.59 a.m. Central Time, then you will be able to vote after noon that same day. Uh, if you vote or if you make a payment after noon until 4.59 p.m. Central, you will be able to vote after 5 p.m. Central Time that same day. And if you pay your dues after 5 p.m. Central, you will be able to vote the next day after 9 a.m. Central Time. And this is when the vote opens. Yes, this is once voting opens. So please do not wait. Yes. Until the very last day, right? After five o'clock at night, um, because it will, would not come. Yes. Right? You would not be able to vote. So it's not automatic when you pay your dues. Um, you do have to, there is a little lag time before it gets into the system. Yes. Um, I want to go over quickly membership eligibility. Members who are in good standing are eligible to vote and are eligible for payment arrangements. If you log in and you find that you are an agency fee payer or an LS objector, you will not be able to vote or set up payment arrangements. If you are one of those member types and you have not signed a membership application, you will have to pay a $50 initiation fee in full for you to become a member to be eligible to vote or apply for a payment arrangement. If you're a former member, meaning you have resigned your membership or you're returning from management, you must complete a membership application and pay your $250 rejoin fee in full to become a member to be eligible to vote or apply for a payment arrangement. And the membership application can be found at apfa.org slash membership application. Payment arrangements. Those members who have a have accrued a balance of $82 or more are eligible for a payment arrangement. Uh, those payment arrangements must, must be active by 5 p.m. on Sunday, July 30th. Active means that you have made your first payment and you have signed a conditional payment agreement and that is on file with the dues department. If you have a balance between $82 and $492, you are eligible for six equal monthly payments for that balance. If you are out, if you have a balance greater than $492 or one year's worth of dues, you would be eligible for 12 months, 12 equal monthly payments. Those are the payment arrangements that were implemented by the board of directors in May to help those who are in a situation where your dues balance has uh, become significantly high. And we really want to encourage you to log in immediately, see if you have a balance, because once uh, after Sunday, July 30th, um, you will be unable to make a payment arrangement in order to vote. That's okay. really important. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the last deadline that's important is the deadline to pay dues. Um, if you do not make a payment arrangement, as Josh said earlier, by Sunday, July 30th, then you must pay your balance in full by August 24th at 5 p.m. Central in order to vote. If you are currently on a leave and you would like to vote, you will need to pay your entire balance accrued while on that leave by August 24th at 5 p.m. Central Time to vote. Hey, thanks, Eric. Thank you. All right, let's move on to everything you need to know about voting. All right, Josh. OK, um, like I mentioned earlier, can anyone see how you voted? No, we will not know how you as an individual voted in this election, this, or in this uh, balloting. It is a secret ballot. We will know that you voted, but we will not know how you voted. Um, additionally, can you change your vote if you've already voted? You may not change your vote once your ballot has been cast. All right. And what about voting on probation? We get a lot of questions from our new hired flight attendants. If yes. they can wear the lanyards, if they can wear the pins, if they can vote um, while they're on probation. So. The answer to all of that is yes. You are eligible to vote while on probation. Our probationary flight attendants are members and they have full rights and privileges of the contract and their legal right uh, to exercise a vote or cast a vote, I should say. 
OK, so let's talk about uh, while the strike authorization vote is out here in the month of, let's see, it starts July 28th through August 29th. What's going to be happening at the terminals? Laura? So every day starting July 28th, when the vote opens, your CAT team ambassadors will be at the terminal. And when we say every day, I mean every day. Uh, you should be able to find a red shirt. Um, you will be wanting to find them for some pins that we'll go over in the next slides. And they're also there to assist you if you have specific questions, to guide you in the login process. If you haven't heard the call center and the email hasn't worked for you, they're also another resource to use and they can guide you. If they can't help you with the specific issue, they will guide you the direction to go to. We encourage people to also join the contract action team. Um, these are flight attendants. Um, they're volunteering. They're getting the word out and helping us um, get the vote out um, by the close date of August 29th. I'll have some information about negotiations too. You can ask them a few questions about negotiations. They're um, staying up to date on everything that's happening at the table. They've definitely been uh, a great extension of the negotiation team that you see here. Um, so they're very well informed. Uh, please definitely use them as a resource. Uh, you can go online to the contract action team page to find out who the base contact person is for your base. Um, you can email them and coordinate to volunteer or if you're looking to get a lanyard or shirts, but please know that they also will have lanyards, pins, um, and any other materials that are available with them during the terminal walks. We are constantly restocking um, specific with the lanyards. We've ordered quite a bit um, and we will have more coming. So if you are waiting on one, thank you for your patience, but they are coming. OK, now that you brought up lanyards, because we have ordered quite a few. Please, if you have a lanyard, do not put it in your bag. We need you to change out your lanyard that you wear, uh, your American Airlines lanyard, and put this We Are Ready lanyard on today until we have a contract. Um, we will also, let's go to the next slide. If Wait, you want can to. you get in trouble for wearing the red APFA We Are Ready one? No, these are approved. Uh, we cannot get in trouble for wearing the pin. Even our probation flight attendants, I know we've had a lot of probation questions about can we wear the lanyard and the pin? Some people have been telling them no, meaning from management, and that is not true. You can definitely wear the lanyard, the pin, the bag tags uh, on your bags. So we have a new pin that we are really proud of. We are ready pin or the war pin. Um, and we received these yesterday. We do have one for every flight attendant here after you have voted. So please, that is definitely what you will um, be looking for your contract action team members out in the terminals, and they'll be handing them out once you tell them that you have voted. Um, and please make sure to wear these pins above your wings. That is where we wear our union pins. It's really important that you put your pin on there. I know we all got into the habit of putting them on our lanyards or in, um, pocket. Or in your pocket. Um, yes, and we've ordered a lot of pins also, uh, but uh, yeah, they do belong above your wings. So um, you can find those as soon as the vote opens. Our contract action team members will be out in the airport uh, terminals and handing out those pins. All right, just a reminder to everyone to wear your lanyard every time you come to work. Wear your union pin above your wings. Make sure that your bag tags are on your bags. And please talk to crew members about what's happening in negotiations. Talk to the other crew members about, ask them if they voted. Uh, make sure that if anybody has any issues, that you can help them where they need to go to get help. Uh, we've given you a few resources today. We're trying to make sure that if anybody has any questions, um, you know where you can find the help. Uh, I think that's it. And yes, of course, once you have voted, make sure that you get your red pin and wear that proudly above your wings. All right. This is me. Okay. Oh, yes. Gosh, I forgot about this one. All right, so August 30th, we will be announcing the results of the strike authorization vote at the picket event. Um, so make sure you join us, please, at one of the picket events. They will be at the 10 bases, but we are expanding to possibly some co-terminals and satellites. Uh, we will give you that information as soon as we have all of those details finalized. 
August 30th. Please uh, keep that date open and we hope to see all of you there uh, for the announcement of um, the support of the strike authorization vote. If you are at a code terminal or a satellite base and you're listening right now, uh, please reach out to your base contact uh, cat ambassador to see if one of your satellite bases is the one we're trying to work out with. We do. We have gotten questions about having things there. What we haven't gotten is volunteers to handle all the logistics, which is what has been the barrier. So if there are people there that are willing to volunteer to take that on, we're happy to have those there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And right. Sure. I think we're ready to move on to our negotiations update, right? We've gotten, we covered yep. everything. All right. So also just before we do move on to the uh, negotiations update, the booklets have all of this information in them. Uh, they will be sent out tomorrow and they will get to your uh, addresses, your physical address uh, by next week, we hope. Uh, and uh, if not, you can always download it from the APFA website. All right, let's move on to our updates for negotiations. We're going to do some of this. Uh, we're going to do this by section. But if you've tuned into our previous uh, town halls, we've talked about some of the provisions that have already been agreed to, some of the improvements that we've already agreed to in reserve and other sections of our contract. Today, we're not going to go back and go through all of those improvements. We are going to talk about primarily uh, the concessions that the company is asking for in these sections. So uh, don't want to give you the wrong impression. We do have agreements here, um, but this is, you know, we're getting to the point of where we're, <laughs> the fight is here and we want you to know um, what we're, we're fighting. So um, Reese is going to update us on the scheduling section. All right, so um, again, these are the concessions that the company is proposing. And as Josh showed earlier, they are all on the website. So if you haven't had a chance or if you have had a chance, but you need a refresher, um, I'm going to go through them quickly. So but if you need more details, it's all on the website or you can look back at hotlines. We've gone into more details in those. So the first one is 10J1D. Um, this is part of our rescheduling language and our contract today protects flight attendants. It says that flight attendants should operate the sequences that they were awarded. It's why, for the most part, you can expect to work your trip as it's scheduled and are deadheaded or otherwise caught up to your trip if something goes wrong with your trip. You are only rescheduled to prevent a delay or cancellation, and reserves must be used before you are rescheduled. Management is proposing a huge exception to this. They want the ability to declare an irregular operation based on weather or projected wrap exhaustion and then reschedule flight attendants as they see fit. This would essentially treat flight attendants as roaming reserves who can be rescheduled to cover the operation as necessary. Anytime management declares irregular operations, we are not interested in this because this would be a huge, huge, huge loss for flight attendants. In 10 J4, management is proposing to extend the rescheduling window from three hours today to four hours. Again, we are not interested. In 10 J7, management is proposing to alter the return to crew base language so that you can be rescheduled past your original arrival time and release time if they are projected to be out of reserves. Again, projected, so it doesn't mean that they're actually out of reserve. It's just well, we might run out. Now they could get you back to they could reschedule you and get you back to base later than you were originally scheduled to be released. In 10 J8, they are management is proposing to um, add the words excluding standbys to the three more than three hour delay language. Today, if there is a three hour delay to uh, pass the departure time, you can call and ask to be released as long as there uh, it won't cause a further delay or cancellation. Most often you're replaced by a standby um, who are who's at the airport already. No delay or cancellation. Adding the words excluding standbys to this would essentially eliminate any option that a flight attendant ever has to exercise their right to be removed from a trip when there's more than a three hour delay. 
Um, finally, they want to um, alter the last uh, 10 section 10 L, which is last sequence, last series language um, and give them management the ability to reschedule you prior to origination. Currently, this language protects you so that you can only be rescheduled after your origination on your um, last sequence or last series of trips. And management wants the ability to be able to reschedule you before you've even originated, which would be, again, a huge loss for flight attendants. Um, finally, in, as part of scheduling, but it's not quite a concession, but just something that we've gotten a lot of feedback lately, so we wanted to make sure we addressed, was the um, ETB drop into open time. So we proposed this um, after working with the base presidents as a way to address the 3% open time and as a way to also address cartel issues and um, manage, uh, management agreed to it. And then they reopened the section because they said they misunderstood what we were asking for. What we are asking for is for any time you pick up a sequence in ETB that you would not be able to straight drop it into open time in TTS. Straight dropping it into open time adds to the 3% and it therefore limit, uh, limits the trading that can go on and any other dropping that can go on because the more that 3% is filled up with other trips, the less um, flexibility all flight attendants have. So our proposal is to eliminate the option for a flight attendant who picks up a trip in ETB to drop that, straight drop it into open time. You would still be able to trade trips with TTS that you picked up in ETB. You'd still be able to be part of chains, which would allow you to drop that trip as long as it was picked up by a different flight attendant. What we're trying to eliminate is the option of you just picking a flight attendant, just picking up a trip and then dropping it, leaving it there, filling up open time with that trip that they didn't want. So thanks, Grace, for that explanation about that. I think I hear quite a bit about the 3%. Everyone asking us, are we going to increase the 3%? And we do not want to increase the 3% because that would mean we would need more reserves to fill that. If we increase it to 5%, it would require more reserves. So instead, we have agreed with the company on a TTS exception that will actually allow more trades to go through on if you have trips on different days. Um, than we are seeing today. The 3% is definitely um, the fact that it, that is what prevents us from being able to do those trades on different days. So we have uh, uh, an agreement with the company on something that will be programmed into TTS that will allow more trades to happen. So I'm glad you uh, brought that up because I know that's been out there a lot. And I'm not sure everybody actually has understood exactly what we're trying to achieve here um, with that provision that we've uh, proposed. All right, uh, going on to our next big section of reserve where we have spent a lot of time on. Uh, we've probably seen the most improvements also in our reserve section, but today we're not going to talk about those improvements. We are going to talk about more of what the company is trying to get. Kelly, you want to take that on? Uh, yeah, so uh, another concession that the company has proposed that we are not interested in is their transition day proposal. Um, for any flight attendants that have been on our picket lines, I'm sure you've done that chant. So if they would <laughs> like to know our interest, that is our chant. Um, another concession that they also have proposed is that they want to change the ability for reserves to pick up flying on their days off. We have some some timing restrictions in place currently. They want to expand on those as well as add another restriction is that any trip that you do pick up on your days off, that home base home base rest would need to be completed prior to originating your reserve day. Um, another concession that we are not interested in, let me stress, not interested in, is no longer allowing a reserve to pick up flying. Um, or pardon me, no longer allowing a reserve to drop their reserve sequence in ETB. Not, not having it. All right, Tim, I know we have a few more in reserve. Yes, they're all still looking to change the um, window of what trips you could be assigned for uh, after your wrap. Currently, it's two hours. You have to be able to report two hours after your wrap. They'd like to see that increased to three hours if you're at a co-terminal station. 
Uh, this would also affect uh, which standbys that you'd be eligible for. They want it to also be three hours after the conclusion of your wrap. Uh, you may recall we passed our reserve proposal back to the company in early June. They did pass back a proposal. We are still looking at it. Um, you'll read more about it in the hotline, but the proposal we can tell you was four years of straight reserve, followed by three years of one on one off and then moving to a one on three off rotation. Um, both the management's proposal and the union's proposal have some similarities. They both tackle kind of the same problem that we're looking to solve. However, uh, there are some differences, so we need to evaluate that and talk about that internally. Uh, so there'll be more information coming on that. Another thing they'd like to change in reserve, which has us scratching our heads, is they want to eliminate that second phone number requirement that they have to call if you have a second number on file. I'm not quite sure why, because this benefits both parties. If you're not at your first phone, um, they can call the second one. Eliminating that would just mean they'd have to give you a missed trip and then call another reserve. So uh, we are standing firm that we want to maintain that ability. I think probably also part a big part of our concern is, is we always don't have cell reception Correct. where we're at. So um, if you're on reserve, then you might be somewhere where you don't have great cell reception. You want to have that second number. So, um, all right. Thanks, Tim and Kelly. Uh, again, those are just what the company is asking for and their proposals, uh, not getting into the improvements. You can um, actually, I think we listed those improvements on one of our recent hotlines. Oh, um, and, and one note about reserve. We were going to talk about attrition. Yes. Um, there's a bit of a misnomer out there on the line. We're getting some feedback that uh, Flight are worried about reserve proposals, that it's going to affect attrition, that new hires are leaving in droves, they're leaving, leaving right and left. Uh, we just want to kind of dispel that rumor. Uh, there, there is some attrition, definitely. Um, when people start this job, usually in the first couple of years, they decide whether the job is a, a good fit for them. So it is normal to see uh, new hires leave in the first few years. That has happened for decades. Um, we do track attrition. We've gone back to 2018 going forward. Uh, the numbers are pretty much in line over the last several years. We did see a big spike, obviously, with attrition in 2020, 2021 with retirements. Um, but remember, attrition also includes terminations. Terminations are definitely up. Um, but as far as new hires quitting in droves, that is just not simply happening. Yeah. Thanks, Tim, for addressing that. that. And we do track it by probation flight attendants also, and we don't see a difference um, from the past. Um, it just seems to be right in line with where it's always been. So, uh, all right, let's move on to section 16, deadheading. And Susan, I think you're going to give some updates on our last sessions with it. We have had countless discussions on deadhead with the company, um, and it continues to be a battle um, that we're going to fight till the end. Um, we have seen the pilot language and we even shared the pilot that had language in case the company uh, had not seen it. And when we <laughs> got the company response last week, it was clear that they think status quo is OK for flight attendants, even when uh, we know the pilots have better language. Um, we are looking for the ability to self book deadhead when you deviate um, from your trip like the pilots have, but we're not willing to sell that by lowering our pass class priority to get it. So we're not giving away our A1 deadheads that we currently have. Um, when you're deviating from your last uh, deadhead leg of the sequence, we want flight attendants to have the ability to uh, change that deadhead seven days prior to the report of the sequence. The company doesn't want you to be able to do that until after a report. Um, and the pilots are not restricted to changing their deadhead to after report of the sequence. Um, the company has zero interest in improving your pa uh, seat, um, highest class available, highest cabin available, or highest seat type available. So that's also something we're fighting for. Um, and for as long as we've been battling deadhead, if we're still fighting this um, now, the battle's only going to get harder when we get deep into economics and our uh, sticking points in uh, Section 10 scheduling. So the, the battle's real, and um, it's it's going to take all of us getting involved now. Thanks, Susan. 
All right, let's move on to general. And Brian, you're going to update on the jump seat. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Um, APFA is going to continue and still um, hold firm on our position um, for the weight and balance uh, for the jump seat that flight attendants not be removed. Uh, for weight and balance. Uh, the company is holding on to their death grip on to that subject um, to remove flight attendants under current language uh, for weight and balance and have gone as far as to state that um, AA is in the business of transporting passengers and not crew members. Um, so we will continue to fight that to um, have that weight and balance uh, put back in that flight attendants will, um, that will apply to us because it's going to help many of our flight attendants, especially our commuters. All right, and uh, Kelly, you're going to give an update on that commuter policy. A little bit of sunshine. <laughs> um, so we do have an agreement in principle, um, as we have uh, reported out on a lot of town halls and hotlines, is that we have got other airlines included. So Delta, United, bring it. Um, we're here for it. Um, another thing that we have that I think is really important is full flights for your flight. And what does a full flight mean? So if there were sufficient seats available, and that is going to be a load factor of less than 90% at check-in time, which is 24 hours prior to departure, just screenshot that. If it all goes to pot within that 24 hours, don't worry, you're going to be covered. I love that. A little bit of sweetness there. We need sugar. a little bit. Yeah, sugar. We, need a little. we do. All right. Next up is section six, which is our hotels, our crew accommodations. Uh, another interesting session we had last week about this. Tim, go ahead and give the update. Yeah, so we passed our proposal to the company back in August of 2021. Uh, they just got back to us this last week with um, their counter proposal. We, if you recall, we were trying to address situations where crew members didn't have a hotel. Uh, they're getting to the downline station and no hotels assigned or they're having to wait for hours on hold, can't get through. Uh, management certainly doesn't wait for hours on hold or sleep in airports and we would feel that our crew members shouldn't have to do that either. Um, time is money and so we were trying to secure a provision that in the situations where this does happen, that our premiums are taken care of both financially and hopefully addressing a, a bigger problem of getting those hotels. Um, they did they did make some movement. Um, however, what they proposed was not satisfactory to us. They want to be able to have three hours from the time they release you to get you a hotel before any sort of additional compensation would kick in. That's just not going to work for us. So we are still going to be uh, working on that. Uh, the other item is we were, had proposed a hotel gain share program, which is similar to what other airlines have. If you're not using your hotel room, uh, you would be able to release that back to the company and then there would be a financial incentive for the flight attendant. They are not interested in that program at all at this point, um, but we are still going to push for that. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, next up is IOD. Brian? Um, our proposals for the IOD um, and two items um, are the flight attendants shall retain and accrue uh, their occupational seniority uh, and longevity for the duration of an IOD. Um, in addition to that, uh, flight attendants will be considered active for the duration of, of the IOD, unpaid occupational injury or medical leave following the IOD for a max of three years. This puts us on a level contractual playing field with the pilots and is very important to us. Um, these two items in particular are currently tabled due to the economics um, and a complete uh, uh, economics proposal is available on our APFA website if you'd like to go back and take a look at that. Thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, Susan, you want to update us on section 32, which is union business. Um, in our first session with the federal mediators, we did get two tentative agreements in section 32, union business, and section 34, safety. The full details of those are available on the negotiations website page on the um, APFA website. Um, after getting those two TAs in the first week with the federal mediator, it gave us hope that we were actually getting movement and maybe coming to the end of this. But when our second session, we got virtually nothing, um, uh, all headways came to a screeching halt. So uh, we're with the federal mediator again next week. We'll see what happens. All right. 
OK, it looks like we've gone through everything here is on our list today. And have we addressed all of the rumors out there? Because I know there's been a few. Oh, I take it back before we get on to that. We were going to have I'm going to have go back to Joe. And um, he's going to talk a little bit more about the economics. OK, um, I, I'll keep this brief. Um, so we uh, submitted a comprehensive economic proposal to the company on March 7th, uh, 2023, um, which included uh, compensation, all of the elements in compensation, uh, expenses and so forth. And it also uh, gets lumped in with our previous proposals on uh, sick and vacation. Uh, the company to date uh, has not responded to our proposal. Um, we anticipate right now we're working through, you know, some of these other sections and the scheduling section. Um, so we're anticipating that we'll be uh, getting a proposal from them, uh, you know, in, in the coming months and in, in the next uh, month or so. I, I would anticipate. Um, you know, we have all kinds of items on economics that are on the table, the, the, and I think it's all available online. Uh, the wage increases, you know, we're, we're seeking signing bonus slash retroactive pay, boarding pay, uh, a lot of other uh, provisions there. So I think there'll be a lot more uh, coming out on the economics as we proceed. Basically, the economics, um, we have our financial analyst, Diane Akins, uh, uh, working on the costing of the agreement. Um, it'll get lumped in the economics with the big outstanding scheduling issues and will be uh, the last issues uh, resolved at the bargaining table as probably a, a overall uh, package proposal that includes the big outstanding issues in the economics. So we'll have a lot more info on that uh, coming forward. All right, Joe, thank you so much for that. I know we get a lot of questions from our flight attendants about, you know, when are we going to see that proposal? Um, it's been a while. Obviously, we've asked multiple times um, and we still do not have it to date. All right, so let's move on to our questions. Um, some of the questions that you may have asked, we, um, we've answered in our update. So if your, your question specifically isn't read and asked, it's because we've already covered it in one of our um, updated uh, questions. So first one we're going to talk about is why are you not making hotel language requirements? Currently, everything is a consideration according to reps from the hotel committee. Reese, do you want to take that one on? Sure. Um, so the consideration, the term consideration, it gives the hotel committee discretion when selecting hotels. They know what's important to flight attendants. Those items that are on that consideration list, they do their best when selecting hotels to make sure that those items are part of the hotel. But it also helps give them, because it's just a consideration, the option and the discretion to select super awesome hotels in super awesome locations that maybe don't have all of those items. Um, if those were requirements instead of considerations, you would be limiting the hotel committee to only consider hotels that have all those items. And so that hotel could be not as great hotel in a not as great location, but it has all those items. So giving, putting, using the word consideration gives them discretion and enables them to give us better hotels, basically. Great, thanks, Reese. Okay, next question. I would think as we move towards, and this slide then says arbitration, but I believe he's saying mediation, that our next serious step, mediators would require good, fair behavior from us, APFA, and the company. Some of the discipline outcomes, performance points, added to good flight attendance files are truly not fair behavior from flight service managers. I have heard more trained union reps working discipline cases, and that's a good thing, but this nitpicky behavior from the company needs to be addressed. What are you doing asking for an update? All right, well, Reese, you can help me out with this if you want, but I would say this, um, that what's happening out there today as far as the discipline, and I, we're seeing discipline for a lot of things, right? EFBs, 
Um, we haven't seen, we were addressing each of those items individually. Your base presidents are actually doing a great job of addressing that with our SBA department and our vice president. And we have been able to come to agreements to where those like with EFB, they will not have something in their file, right? So we have been working on agreements um, for things like that. We have also been putting testimonials out from our flight attendants showing this company, showing the flight attendants and showing the public what, how are we are treated by American Airlines. Um, the testimonials, of course, address more our AFSMs and our attendance policy. And just a reminder that attendance policy, we did have a presidential grievance on back in 2018. And so it is something that has already been grieved. And there were some changes made after that grievance, um, but everything that was grieved, um, we did not make. So where we are at with the attendance policy has already been grieved. And so some of the items that we are seeing are definitely from the AFSMs and that change to our system. And we are addressing that every way we can. Um, we also contractually in section 30 and 31 have made some recent progress. And I will say this, it's for especially the progress that we're seeing on this is when you file a notice of dispute about something that has happened to you. It is to make sure that that is heard in a much quicker time frame than it was heard in the past. We are already seeing some of this today, but we are um, getting that into section 30 and 31 um, so that we can make sure, especially if you're terminated also, um, that your arbitration is much sooner than a year or two after you've been uh, terminated. So we are addressing each of the, these items that you've been seeing out there in different ways. Um, and in the contract, we're addressing some of the ways that we grieve and the timeframes of when those grievances are heard in section 30 and 31. And I just wanted to add, because um, the question asker did use the word arbitration and arbitrators, um, that we are in section six negotiations. And so even if they may have meant mediation, um, great if they meant that. If they didn't and if they meant arbitration, just a reminder that we are in section six um, and there is no arbitration and there is no binding arbitration, all those scary things that happened before. Um, this is very different and so just a reminder to everybody and to, you know, if you hear those terms out on the line um, to correct people because this is very different. Thanks, Reese. Very good point. All right, next question. Do you have a qualified contract negotiator helping you every day? Yes, Joe Burns, <laughs> the best in the business, to say the least. He's on here with us today um, and he is leading us. And I will say we are very fortunate that he was on loan to us um, for probably much longer than what he had thought and what we had thought. Um, so uh, the other question was, has AA responded to our compensation proposal? I think we've already addressed that today. No, they have definitely not responded to our economic proposal. All right, uh, is there a plan to improve the reserve system? There is too much crew wasting along with deadheading all over the system when it's not necessary while taking up passenger seats. Can we please go back to the old LUS system to where it's a humane and livable reserve? Uh, Tim, you wanna take that on? Sure, uh, so it's important to note that the deadheading all over the system as much as it may seem an inconvenience to the reserve getting called out, it actually is a protection for line holders. Um, some airlines, they reschedule line holders first and then use the reserves at the end. As you know here, before they reschedule a line holder, they have to use the reserves if, if there's time to do so. Um, so interestingly enough though, this is one of the areas the company has made a proposal and they'd like to see the ability to stand up uh, dead, deadheading uh, flight attendants in certain situations, but those situations are pretty ambiguous. Um, so we are holding firm on our position at this time. But again, that the deadheading, it is a protection for line holders. So um, we want to hold on to that as much as possible. I think uh, I think would agree that that is important to our flight attendants. So. Okay. Anything else, Tim, or are we good? I think we're good. Okay. And definitely we have spent a lot of time on reserve and making improvements. So we've already seen a lot of improvements in that system. 
Okay, I think this one was already asked um, or answered. How long does the committee expect the mediated negotiations to take? <laughs> um, and I know Joe talked about this earlier. We do have sessions uh, on our calendars until through December of this year, and we hope that that's all we need. Um, is the committee seeing better results with negotiations since the start of mediation? Well, I think Susan addressed this earlier. We definitely saw good results in our first session with the mediators. Um, we made a lot of progress in that section, our session. And uh, the last session that we had last week, uh, we did not see that progress. So mixed results as far as with the mediators at this point. They're great. They're really helping us, um, but they are there to help us move along. Um, and um, there's only so much sometimes you can do with American Airlines. So. Uh, Joe, you want to add anything in on that? Are you still there? I, I, I am still here. No, I, I, I think that covers it. I mean, we, you know, I think it's hard to separate out. Um, we've got the mediators coming uh, involved in the bargaining, which can, uh, can be helpful, but we've also got an impending strike vote. Um, so I think all of those are going to kind of work together to increase the pressure on the company uh, to reach an agreement. And it's, uh, I, I, it's not all going to be attributable to the mediators, but I think it's uh, as we get to the end, people have to make difficult decisions and that'll be the case for uh, the management team. Thanks, Joe. OK, uh, next question. Why do you push for a greater number of cursors system wide rather than per base? What specific financial penalties are you negotiating when the company violates parts of the contract? Specifics, please. Reese, do you want to take that one on? Sure. Um, so we did propose, and AA did agree to more cursors system wide. It's 100. Um, but we also added the words um, base specific need for purser can also be. Are, and it will be in addition to the yearly slots. So um, we did increase the number system wide, but they may also do base specific purser offers um, in addition to those yearly slots. This is agreed to language. You can refer to it in section 14 international on the website. Um, the specifics for financial penalties, there are a few that we're adding um, or changing. So today we have 150% um, pay for crew scheduling error after origination. Um, we changed that and the company agreed to um, after report. We also added the miss award process, which is um, in place today, but it's not contractualized. We added it to the contract. The company agreed to add that to the contract um, and it addresses many of the, the errors that are made by crew scheduling before report. So using between the new language and um, the missile word process being added in there, in there, there will be a lot of um, financial penalties uh, for errors made by crew scheduling. For reserves who experience missile awards, um, today there is no pay penalty. And so we are holding, the company has not agreed to it yet, but we are holding that they will also be paid 150% if a reserve works a trip that they were missile awarded. Um, Finally, as Tim talked about in his update on Section 6, um, hotel, uh, crew accommodations, we are proposing a penalty pay when the company fails to provide a hotel or transportation in a timely manner, which they are required to do so by the contract. There's not going to be any changes to their requirement to provide, but if they fail to do so, if there is some sort of irregular, crazy weather thing that happens, um, you should be compensated for the, the issue that you're having getting a hotel or transportation. All right, thanks, Reese. OK, next question. What is the plan for our union to relieve the West Coast bases, Los Angeles and Phoenix with reserve? The current and future plans seem to be OK for some bases, but for the West Coast, it doesn't help. All right, well, we have had a lot of conversations about Los Angeles and Phoenix and what what the management needs to do in order for this to work uh, at this point. They have not uh, responded. They have not given us anything as far as what their plans are for those bases. I can tell you I've had conversations for two years about this. We did put in our proposal for reserve that um, our reserve proposal needs to have something in it to address the high seniority of those bases. When the company returned their proposal, there was nothing in there for those two bases. 
So um, we will continue to work on this. This is not something that we um, we do not know about. This is not something we don't care about. We really care about those bases also, and any base could become a high seniority reserve base at any time. So we definitely need something in the contract, and we are, will continue to work on that. Um, is there plans to negotiate to bring back our staffing levels to pre-COVID since our service is back? This is one of our biggest issues. And if you've heard anything out in the news, we talk about this on a very regular basis. We want everyone to know that American Airlines took advantage of the pandemic and they cut our staffing when our service and our passengers were not there. And when our service and our passengers and the profits are back, American Airlines has not agreed to bring our staffing back. This is unacceptable, and this is definitely one of the items um, that we are negotiating for. What is the status of a flight attendant being on unpaid medical leave and the 12 month clock con concerning stating under company paid health benefits before being switched to COBRA? It is my understanding the pilots get three years, while well, we get only 12 months. Kelly, you wanna answer that? I sure will. Um, Brian touched on a little bit when he was going over section 27 earlier with IOD. Um, while we are um, have proposed the three years uh, active to medical rates while you're on an unpaid status, um, that actually goes outside of IOD. That touches everybody on a yeah. medical status um, as well as the IOD. That is very, very important to us. Um, it is kind of disparate treatment between the pilots and us and COBRA rates are ugly. Yep, they're too much. Thanks, Kelly. OK, next one. I appreciate your transparency with regards to these negotiations. In that vein, can we expect the same transparency prior to voting? on what we will be sacrificing from our existing contract. It's important information to take into consideration when deciding on how we want to vote. Brian, I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, transparency is, is vital to us. Um, as all of you have seen from the very beginning of this, um, we have been as transparent um, and more so than we, we ever have in both legacies. Um, so transparency to to our membership is, is critical. Um, this is an item that we've discussed internally. Um, and as we get closer to that final process of presenting you a TA, um, it's something that we need to look at and, and review to see where we are and, and be able to present that to you. If you go on to our web page now, um, you can see some of that transparency and see what, what agreements that, um, especially those items that have been TA'd and where we stand on what what both sides have agreed to um, within the, uh, the the web page on APFA. Um, but as we get closer, that's something that we'll look at uh, in a little bit more internally to to make sure that you are up to date and aware of everything that's going on. So that you when you do vote, it's it's a vote that you can be secured and conf confident in when you make that vote. Thanks, Brian. I, we have no plans to change the transparency at all. So when we get to the point where we have a tentative agreement, we will give you everything we possibly can and anything that is, um, if there is a concession, if there is a concession, um, of course, we are going to um, put that out there to you uh, from our current contract. And um, that is not something we have no plans to change that. I think last week um, when there was a rumor out there that we were hiding the an economic proposal that the company um, had passed back to us. Uh, we wanted to make sure everyone got the information as soon as possible, that that was not true. Um, as soon as we get the information and as soon as we can kind of um, make sure we can get it onto the website, because before we put out a hotline, we make sure we update the website. So that's why sometimes we might end our sessions on Thursday and then you'll get the hotline either the next week after it or the week after. We're trying to get it quicker to everyone at this point. Um, so you will get the hotline of what happened last week, uh, this week, and probably I think it's going out tomorrow morning. So um, we're, we're getting better at that process, but it does, it's a bit of work. It's not just the hotline, it's also updating the website. Okay, uh, next question. When are you going to reopen section 15 and fix the language to recognize and represent the language qualified flight attendants in a way that does not diminish them or their contribution to the safe operation of our flights. 
Susan, you want to take that one on? Um, sure. No, this team recognizes the role uh, that speaker flight attendants have on our uh, trips that have um, need a uh, language of destination. And just to be clear, the T8 uh, section 15 did not reduce the number of speakers on an aircraft. Um, since we TA that section, the company did announce a change to aircraft reconfiguration, um, and they'll be deleting the first class cabin and increasing business class and PE. So we've agreed to reopen section 15 to see how those changes in cabin configuration can, um, uh, how, how do we address that? But know that when a section gets reopened, the company can also make changes too. It's just not a one sided thing. So uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, that will likely happen soon, um, but not yet. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Uh, OK, we've had many conversations about that. Hopefully the speakers know that we plan to reopen that um, based on the changes that were made uh, to the configuration of the aircrafts. All right, next up. I was wondering what the company says to justify its resistance to improving our contract. The CCI messages to flight attendants tout that we are operating 25% more flights than our competitors. That is right. They say that I see 30% more than 25. Uh, outperforming them on most categories. Recently had a record holiday performance, etc. And yet the JCBA was negotiated in a bankruptcy environment and is fast approaching the fourth year of being amendable. How are they justifying their harsh stance about not improving our contract? Hmm. Reese, want to take that on? <laughs> um, there's one word here and it's greed. Um, if you've been following along with the Screen Actors Guild, the Screen Writers Guild, or any labor movement, um, Starbucks, Amazon, they're all fighting workers, labor, they're fighting for rights, they're fighting for pay um, in, in times when their management, their companies are experiencing record profits. Um, shareholders are getting paid, but their workers are not the ones that are holding up the operation. So um, we agree with you 100%. And um, it's a great question to ask um, our lovely CEO tomorrow during the state of the airline, <laughs> if you'd like. Um, he, because it's a question for the company, you know, why aren't you paying your workers what, what they've earned? I think we said at the, at the start, this is a red hot labor summer for a yep. reason, right? All workers are revolting and telling management, we're not going to take it anymore. Right? And that's, you said it perfectly, greed. All right, and profits for them. Uh, I think that we could go back to when we look at our profit sharing this year, right? 1.3% right? for us, up to 60% bonuses for management. That is totally unacceptable. I want everybody, as you're voting for the strike authorization vote, to remember that. Okay? This is the company, and this is how they feel about you. 1.3%. Not two, not three, not six. five, six <laughs> not, yeah, 60 for them. So we'll get us started. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, would it be feasible to have a video of someone explaining each section of the contract after it is ratified? My reasoning is that I believe this type of education would be effective, and I am convinced that the more educated flight attendants are, the more empowered we are. I like this question. <laughs> Since base presidents sleep at night and sometimes fly trips and need sleep, thank you. Um, what about instituting an 800 number to call between the hours of 5 p.m. and 9 a.m. or 24 hours a day? All right, Kelly, I know you you signed up to take this one on. I, I know there's a reason why. I love this question too, because um, I'm a video or podcaster person, so I think it's a great idea and I'm glad it's on the radar. And I love the videos that we're putting out now with yeah. the testimonials, with all the ones that we've all done. Um, and I am 100% with this, with this guy that no one of us is smart as all of us. Yeah. So let's raise the collective and nobody's going to be able to stop us. So as far as the base president part, you know, we do have the extended live chat hours that, you know, we're cutting outside of um, uh, business hours and things like that. And I know each base has um, their own unique phone system because I know like Dallas has one, Phoenix has one, Tennessee. yeah, Charlotte. Yeah. Um, and I like that each base has their own little personality of how they cover um, their calls. 
Um, so whatever base you're in, I think it's Boston. Um, definitely reach out to Kelly and see what they have um, up there. Okay. I, the videos. I agree with you 100%. I think that for us, um, it has definitely been uh, part of the mission for the national officers to try and help our membership is um, provide them with as much information as we possibly can about your contract, but about everything, right? Your the policies also um, about how your union works. Um, the town halls have helped greatly. Uh, I think that we have more plans for the future. We definitely would love to see an app here. It hasn't happened as fast as we wanted it to happen, but we think that really is the next step here um, in helping provide as much information as possible. Also, I just wanted to remind you, um, we do have our hours right now are seven to seven uh, yeah. for our reps uh, that are on the phone and will answer a, a call for you. Contract scheduling. Yeah. Contract scheduling reps. And then also after that, we have live chat until 11 o'clock at night. And live chat's available from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Time yeah. and 9 to 5 on the weekends. Yes. And we also have our strike vote uh, reps who are available via live chat as well. Yeah. 9 to 5. 9 to 5. Though. Yep. So, and as far as the tentative agreement is concerned, um, we'll have something similar to what this looks like right now, a, a web page uh, with all resources. We'll have a call center. Um, so we're not there yet, but when we get there, you'll definitely know what resources are available to you. Uh, so just I want to make sure everybody does realize that uh, we are definitely available to you after 5 p.m. at National. Uh, like Eric said, it is uh, contract scheduling reps until 7 and then till 11 o'clock at night live chat. That's yep. 3 to 11 and 9 to 5 on the weekends. Okay. We're getting there. Baby steps. Yeah. OK, is there still a discussion of a minimum of 30 hours or a hard 40? Uh, Kelly signed up for that. Yes, why yes, there is. Um, if you check out the website, we do have or we have proposed and we've been holding on that outside of PDS, you would be able to use the various systems to go down to 30 hours. Okay. Planning on hanging on to that. We've heard a lot about that flexibility for our flight attendants. Uh, a lot of flight attendants say they want to be able to go down to be able to go back up. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that I'm sure we have some that want to work between 30 and 40. Obviously, also with our economic proposal was an increase in our vacation pay. Um, that will also help with when we do have vacation on those funds, um, getting five hours a day. That is what we have proposed. Um, the company has not agreed to yet, um, but that would also help um, on those months. And more vacation days. And more vacation days. Yeah. OK, that finishes our questions. I think let's just go over a few more points. We will have more town halls uh, during this strike vote, so I don't want you to think this is the last one. And I know we are. This has been a very long town hall, um, but I want everybody to remember that this is a strike authorization vote for APFA to be able to call a strike if we feel ne if it's necessary. Um, and that it is not a vote for a tentative agreement. We are still negotiating, as you can tell by everything we've just told you today. So we still have a lot of work to do, um, but this is a vote to basically send a, man a message to management, okay, about the strike authorization vote. So please remember that. Um, talk to the other flight attendants that are out there. Make sure that they are they know where to receive the information they need or ask the questions that they have. Um, and look for the booklets that will be coming in the mail very soon to you. And the strike authorization vote will open in how many days, Josh? I'm making a count. <laughs> no, no, it's Friday. I was, was going to go to the counter with that. OK, let's see. I, I don't have it up on my screen, but. Uh, it is opening in eight days, 19 hours, 30 minutes, and 20 there we go. 19. 18 seconds. Uh, yeah. Pacific. Yes. And, right, and right after you vote, get your war pin for yeah. your That's right. contract action team in your base or anywhere in the system. And one last reminder, do not forget when you go to work, wear your red lanyard, put your pin above your wings, make sure your bag tags are on your bags. Um, it means a lot. Yes, above the wings. We do not work at TGF for our days. Oh, and really right. everybody on the property at this point, every single flight on the property can wear the lanyard, they wear the pin, they can use the bag tags, and can participate in the strike authorization vote. Including probation. Including yep. probation. Mm -hmm. Everyone on the property. All right, Josh, just. 
we're, we're going to end this with um, something that uh, we have been saying from the start, right? And I'm going to ask the question of everybody here, and all of you can join us if you'd like. Um, I think you all know what question I'm going to ask, right? Are you ready? We are ready. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to vote. All right, we'll see you on the next town hall, and we will be out in the terminal here in Dallas tomorrow, starting at one o'clock, answering questions for our flight attendants. So if you have questions, uh, see us in, in Dallas at one o'clock tomorrow, probably about one to five or six. So thank you everyone for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thank Bye, you. Safe. Bye. Bye.